Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great. Uh, my Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Slightly thinner crowd online. Um, Tim Alcoholic. Very glad to be here. Um, I've, I've got you up on screen properly now. So if people want to share their screens or share, not to share their screens, um, turn their cameras on. I can see your bright little faces there. And that, that gives me someone to talk to as well as the people in person. So don't be shy to show yourself. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. Lovely. Look at that. I had them all set Lisa, off. Um, Lisa Santa Maria and Espina and Porrick and Molly. Oh, very good. Very good. I, and now I can know who I'm talking to now. People from all over the place. Right. So uh, we've got uh, a couple of hours left this afternoon with a half hour break in between. Uh, we've got step 10. Uh, we've got step 11. We've got step 12. I haven't outlined this. So literally anything could happen. So buckle up. I don't know where this is going to go. Um, what occurs to me before going into 10, 11 and 12, I know there are some people here that weren't here in the in the earlier sessions. So I'm just going to do a very brief recap and by the way in case there are people from other fellowships you're totally welcome we don't care if you want and need to be here then just be here and whatever helps is amazing and if it doesn't help don't worry about it there we go so um why do we get to steps 10 11 and 12 why where i got to steps 10 11 and 12 is i am a liability to myself uh in an aa point of view and from an Al-Anon point of view as well, I need need to be kept very, very firmly. I need to be kept very, very firmly within my hula hoop, uh, which is trying to do God's will. That's what I'm here for. The first nine steps put me in a position where I'm actually able to do that. Uh, because what they do in step eight, in the 12 and 12, there's an amazing line. It's an extraordinary line when you realize what it's saying. And I don't have it verbatim in front of me, but it says that defective personal relationships were at the root of all of our problems, including our alcoholism. Uh, and I'm actually going to go down an Al-Anon path very briefly in just a moment. Um, but what that means is for the first nine steps, they solved my relationship with other people because I think it was Sandy B who would say that if you've got a problem with other people, you've got one of two solutions. You either have to forgive them or you have to make amends to them or sometimes both. And if you do that, and that's my experience, if I let everyone else off the hook for everything they've done, I'll come to what I mean by that in a moment, and I essentially seek forgiveness from other people, the act of seeking forgiveness re renders me forgiven whether or not the person recognizes that themselves. I don't need other people's forgiveness, but seeking to repair the relationship with other people is entirely sufficient. Um, the willingness, in fact, in step eight, Don Pritz would talk about this, that you get free in step eight, not step nine. Step nine is the follow through of step eight, but the freedom comes from being totally willing to go to anyone and say, this is what I did. I shouldn't have done it. I regret doing it. I would like to set this straight. Show me how I can set this straight. And I got free from doing that. And there are half a dozen people that I have not been able to find over the years, despite annual attempts to do so. And I tell you, if they walked in this room now, I would seat them on the front row, shake their hands and, and take them out to dinner. Uh, I have absolutely no fear, no compunction about going to these people, absolutely falling on my sword and trying to repair the relationship uh, with them. Uh, all of this, once I'm free of my disordered relationships with other people, uh, so I, th there might still be problems, but I'm free. I'm free to move forward. Then I'm free to live in steps 10, 11, and 12. But I want to cover, I know there are some Al-Anons here. Uh, I, you won't necessarily be marking yourself as such in the participant list, but I know you're there. <laughs> like me, see, I'm an Alan on monitoring the room, monitoring the room, always monitoring. Is there any danger out there? Um, 
Uh, but the defective relationships in Al-Anon, it doesn't hurt to cover a little bit of Al-Anon step one. Um, if you're an alcoholic, you're going to be surrounded by people who are alcoholics and addicts. And if you're not an Al-Anon by the time you get to AA, by the time you've been in AA for 30 years, boy, are you ripe for Al-Anon if you haven't been before. Uh, because the reaction to the alcoholic, uh, it, you don't realize you're doing it, but you become entangled in a thousand ways. Uh, and here's a test. If you sponsor people... And you ever catch yourself thinking about your sponsee when your sponsee is not in the room or not talking to you, you might want to consider why you're thinking about them when they're not there. What is going on there? Occasionally, there's a bit of strategic thinking, but any kind of preoccupation with how is the sponsee doing? Why haven't they done what they're supposed to do? Why don't they listen to what I say? All of that stuff. <laughs> then consider Al-Anon and the defective relations. Um, um, my Alanonism, and this isn't this is, all of this. What I'm going to say is in the Alanon literature, but um, uh, Alanon, the Alanon literature. This is a personal opinion, so this is not this opinion is not endorsed by AA, the World Service Office, the General Service Office of Great Britain, or <laughs> Alanon. In a, this is my view, is that uh, the Alanon literature is there are so many books. There are so many pamphlets. They contain so much information that if you want to know about step one in Al-Anon, there's no single place to go to to read about it. So in the way that if you want to read about the physical craving in the big book, you know exactly which chapter to go to. If you want to read about step three in the big book, you know exactly which chapter to go to, which pages to go to. It's very clear. Al-Anon, it's not clear. Uh, there are so many books written by committee. So the big book was chiefly written by, is the text part of it was written just by one person, except for one chapter. Uh, Al-Anon was written by a huge number of people, which has advantages, but it has disadvantages. And the disadvantages, it's like if you, if you have a fe feather pillow and you take all the feathers out and you hide them all over the world, all the pillow is in the world. But you have to assemble the feathers into the pillow yourself. And my Al-Anon in step one has been like that over the years, gradually figuring out a coherent understanding of step one. And my Al-Anon problem uh, is a relationship problem, specifically relationships with alcoholics, addicts and disordered people. And it comes in these forms. So you've got an alcoholic in, in front of you who is suffering and incompetent if they're in their cups or if they haven't found recovery, and maybe for a while after they've found recovery, uh, suffering, disordered, all sorts of things wrong. Uh, the first thing I will do is try to look after them in recognition of the fact that if they're left to look after themselves, they may die. So I need to step in and look after them to stop them from dying. So I mother uh, and I will martyr myself. I will run my, uh, 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 I'm a lot better at this now, but I would run myself ragged for people I'm close to who are alcoholic, addict, or disordered. Uh, and this is, again, another opinion. It's embedded in the culture of AA to never say, a, never say uh, no to an AA request. Um, I would adjust that very, very slightly to say never say no to an unreasonable AA request. And not every request that comes from an AA member is an AA request. It could be the request of, of someone who's very unwell. It's not their fault. They're very unwell. And so will you come and talk to me at three o'clock in the morning across town? No, I won't do that. There are people who will, and maybe it's right that there are people who will do that. But I'm not one of those one of those people. My phone goes off at a certain time, and I spend many, many hours a week sponsoring, doing service, doing blah, blah, blah. But there are limits. And if I am spending all my time rescuing, is that God's will? Just because someone asks me to do something from an Al-Anon point of view, is it necessarily God's will? Maybe, maybe not. As everything I do takes me away from something else. Maybe I have more requests on my time than I have time. So I do have to choose between the things which are asked of me. Uh, uh, so it's not letting other people take responsibility for themselves. 
and then me taking responsibility. One of the mirrors of this is I have a tendency, and, and anyone that knows me for more than about five minutes will recognize this instantly. I have a tendency to waltz in and take charge of any situation I'm in and start issuing directions. And being, as a friend of mine says, being clear and being right doesn't always help. <laughs> so even if the advice, if followed, would be for the good of all, it does not do anyone any good for me to actually, and often I'm wrong, but that's not the point. The point is uh, I should not, I'm, I've not been appointed by the universe to be in charge of everything, but I will make myself in charge of everything. Um uh, in the motto, and, and this is not an official Al-Anon motto, but I think it ought to be, if you want something doing, you better do it yourself. Uh, that characterized a lot of my life. So running myself ragged, taking control of everything, uh, bulldozing, pushing. There's, uh, the, you know, the Peanuts cartoons uh, with Char Charlie Brown. There's a scene between uh, Lucy and I identify, Lucy is my alter ego in in peanuts it's not very flattering either to lucy or to me um but there's a conversation with lucy where um lucy says to someone how many times does four go into three and the other character says four doesn't go into three and lucy says it does if you push and that's my alanonism Alan out of control i can make things happen but the cost can be terrible and people have uh, reported to me that the cost is terrible of me, as I said earlier, monitoring, surveilling, uh, minor corrections, little facial expressions to indicate that I don't approve of what is being said and done. All of these subtle, not actually subtle attempts to control other people. So there's, con there's on one side, there's the mothering, looking after people, looks benign, isn't because it's stopping people from learning how to look after themselves. It's stopping people from hitting their rock bottoms. And then uh, the whole control thing. And then I'm so busy. Uh, I, once many years ago, um, the poor chap, I, I, I was so tired, I fell asleep in the middle of his step five. I don't think that's right. There's something would you now, and it wasn't because it was dull. Okay, it was probably really dull. I mean, it was a step five, what are the chances? But nonetheless, uh, that wasn't the point. The point was I was so exhausted, uh, all the stuff I was doing in recovery and so on, that there was no there was no equilibrium there. Uh, things were out of whack. I was not looking after myself. Um, uh, I was at a, a, an AA meeting in Glasgow many years ago, and I can't report what the gentle lady of Glasgow said verbatim because we're in mixed company it's before the the, the nine o'clock threshold but she said you're of no good to anyone else if you're in a devil of a state yourself and she didn't say devil it was a four-letter word you're of no good to anyone else if you're in a devil of a state yourself so i've had to learn to take care of myself on purpose because if i don't do it on purpose it won't happen at all and my nothing gets in the way of my sleep and eating decent food and exercise, because if I don't do that, I'm of no use to anyone. And the, 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 so there's craziness and not me not taking responsibility for me, me taking responsibility for you, me not letting you take responsibility for you. And the flip side of that is that I will put up with extraordinarily disordered behavior and it will be like I've got some kind of emotional leprosy that I won't realize that this is really dysfunctional, this is really dangerous, this is really damaging, because I make excuses for the other person and won't let them be accountable for the consequences of their actions. I'm the, I'm the mattress that I let them fall on. And I'm not a mattress, which is why it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up, you know, covered in bruises, metaphorically, and you wonder, there's a line in Proverbs chapter 23 about people, uh, someone who wakes up with bruises a lot and doesn't know how they got there. I can be like that. I can spend a day with someone and feel emotionally bruised the next day and not realize it's connected with spending the day with someone and I should be more careful about who I'm spending my time with. Mm.
but I won't res. I just think I'm in a bad mood today. I don't know why. Covered in bruises. <laughs> blind spot. Alcoholics. I have an alcoholic blind spot. I have an alanonic blind spot. I will burn myself on people who are on fire and have no idea where the welts are coming from. Repeatedly, again and again and again. And we haven't got to the crazy bit. Not even close. The crazy bit. Uh, I make other people responsible responsible for me, uh, not just through blame throwing by uh, indicting other people for the way they affect me. And we talked a lot about that earlier. Um, but also, uh, who do I look to to rescue me? Alcoholics, because they're a whole lot more fun than regular folks. Uh, alcoholics are fun until they're not. But by then you're in too deep and you can't choose who you care about. And that's why Al-Anon exists, because we can't choose who we care about. What we can choose is how we respond to the people we care about. And so the first nine steps in Al-Anon are for me about unhooking myself cell by cell by cell from the, as a friend of mine puts it, the orphans with the big eyes and the broken wings. Uh, and learning to save, as Mary Oliver puts it, to save the only life which I can save, which is my own. And I can only save my own life by recognizing I cannot save my own life. God, you're going to have to do a hell of a lot of this. I do 1%, you do 99%, I say to God, but I have to do my 1%. So what this does in AA and Al-Anon, uh, and I, for the record, I'd be, I, my first Al-Anon meeting was in September uh, 1995. Uh, my other half at the time was an alcoholic in recovery who went on holiday. And I spent, I think, four days thinking all day about whether or not he'd slipped. And so I went to Al-Anon and uh, ignored everything they said. Uh, and then he didn't slip and he came back. And it was a little while before I went to another Al-Anon meeting. Oh, well, obviously I was overreacting. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, so anyway, completing the first nine steps um, renders me in a position where I can finally breathe at last. I feel as I've been given at least five minutes to myself now. I've got five minutes. What am I going to do with it? Spend it wisely. 10, 11, 12. Um, 10, 11, 12. There, there, there's a, oh, damn, I'm going to say something I shouldn't say, but I'm going to say it. Um, sometimes they say the steps are in an order for a reason. And the reason they're in an order is because in the West, we have a linear numbering system, which requires them to be in an order. <laughs> that is why they're in an order. It's not... The, the program is a holistic, in my view, is a holistic package deal, which has two, which has two elements. There's the element of clearing up the past, which is the first nine steps. And there's the element of daily living, which is summed up in steps 10, 11 and 12. And then you've got the traditions to govern how we interact with other people. And then you've got the concepts to govern how we get stuff done. Uh, without uh, murdering each other or committing suicide in the process. Uh, so it's not a matter of you do you do this step and then it's done and then you do the next step and then it's done. Now, the first nine steps, there is a logic and a sanity to the order that they're in, and that's fine. But when you look at the first six steps, so originally there were six steps in AA, and imagine you're at your home group and someone comes back and says, uh, I, I know that we used to have 12 steps. Now we have 24. That's literally what happened, except it was with six and 12. When Bill went away to write the book, came back with 12 steps, not six. And those six are in a different order than our 12. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So this, this thing about we mustn't proceed on to the next step. So often there are things which happen simultaneously. Uh, some amends start as soon as you're in AA, the 12 and 12 is very good on this. There are certain things that you can start to make right straight away. You At home, you can start doing the dishes. You can start picking up your own socks. 
This is starting to make amends to other people. You can start showing up for things when you said you were going to show up for things. And that takes the edge off the difficult relationships with other people. Um, so I'm just distracted by a sound out there. Um, what was I saying, Rob? <laughs> talking about how uh, you can make amends like right away, like doing the oh things stuff. in an order for a reason. That's it. Things being in an order for a reason. So what this means is, when I was new, um, um, I remember talking to Maureen about this, and I said, "We were talking about doing step ten. I can't do step 10. I've been in AA for only three weeks. I can't. Do, uh, the steps are in order for a reason. She said, oh, you stupid boy. And she said, you must. If, if people who are 10, 20, 30 years sober need to um, plan the day. And if could we close that door back there? Back that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, so if people 10, 20, 30 years sober need to plan the day and pay attention to what is going on during the day, and then do a review at the end of the day. Why do you think, how, how are newcomers supposed to just wing it? If someone 30 years sober can't wing it, you're asking a newcomer to wait until they completed the first nine steps before they get on to 10. No, 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 no. Maureen also said, if you're a few days sober, you can explain to someone that's one day sober how they get to five days sober. You can start to carry, not the full message, but you can carry as much message as you have acquired to other people, whatever you've learned. In fact, uh, the, the realm of the spirit operates in an opposite way to the realm of the material. If you let go of something physically, it drops to the floor. If you let go of something spiritually, it rises up to the higher power. And then you rise up too. When you let go, you rise up as well as it, but separately. <laughs> It goes in one direction, you go in the other. It, it's the opposite. When you share, if you share your, I'm in Arizona, your taco with someone, you have less taco, they have more. Uh, if you share an idea with someone, you get to keep the idea, but now they have the idea. So if you, if there's an idea you find helpful, you a sponsor or you read it, uh, somewhere you hear it on a podcast or an AA tape, tell everyone, tell everyone the idea, because it's the only way you will get the idea to be so buried in your consciousness, it comes up and hits you in the face when you need it. So to carry the message widely, if they want you to stop, they'll tell you. Okay, so just carry the message. Uh, the worst you can be, do, the worst you can be is annoying. And that's not the worst thing in the world. It, it gives people something to write inventory about. <laughs> so to start steps 10, 11, and 12 promptly. Also, the other thing, there's this terrible thing that goes around. I, th I don't want to malign New York, but I think it started there where they say, we wish you a long, slow recovery. And then they sort of waltz off and leave you to your suffering. Uh, I don't wish anyone a long, slow recovery. I wish some, well, certainly a long recovery, a, a permanent recovery, absolutely. Not a slow one, a quick one. You wouldn't wish anyone with a physical disease, I hope you get better slowly. No. Now, there are things which take months and years to get over. Frank, that's just true. But um, the, 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 one must make a distinction between the action, which can be taken promptly and briskly and thoroughly, and the results. Now, the results are a little bit like the checks in the post. So you can do the work, but you won't necessarily get instant results cropping up in your life. You won't necessarily notice straight away that what you're doing is working. And uh, my sponsor, uh, oh, gosh, he's on there. Oh, God, I've got to watch my step now. Um, <laughs> he's probably heard the rest of it, too. Um, he talks about, in, in good Texan analogy, when you... Uh, pump water uh, fr uh, from a well, the, f the first many pumps won't necessarily yield up water, but once the water starts flowing, it really gushes. And it's exactly like that with the actions of the program, that you start to take the actions. Nothing may appear to happen for days or weeks or months. I mean, you'll stay sober. But every single action you take stores up treasures in heaven 
for you, but they get released in bunches all at once. But there's a terrible curse attached to this. When you stop taking the action in AA, as I know from personal experience, when I, as I stopped going to AA for two years, I didn't drink, but I became funky and not in a good way. Okay, I just leave your uh, feverish imaginations to construe what that might mean in practice. But um, uh, I, I, I became a lower companion. Let's put it like that. Um, if you stop taking the actions, you coast on past actions for quite a long time until you discover that you're so you've 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 drifted so far away from shore. No amount of paddling will bring you back which is why sometimes you hear people when you we call them doing chairs in the UK when people do a talk from the at the beginning of to a 20 minute talk half an hour talk at the beginning of a meeting it's a pitch in some places it's a chair in others it's a main chair in Bristol Bristol's Bristol AA is its own thing you need to know that about Bristol um very common ne uh, listen out for this because you'll hear it people who are three four five years sober talking about what they were doing one or two years sober and saying yeah I don't do as much as that anymore I don't get to as many meetings as I used to I'm not sponsoring as many people I'm not as strict with myself about my steps 10 11 but I'm doing really well on the outside yeah for now for now but how long is that going to last it the 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 recut that the results of recovery actions in my experience are a slow burn the actions must be brisk and prompt this is page 58 we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start so clear your schedule get the step work done but what we claim is progress not perfection so you don't get instant perfect results and if you if ever you've made a birthday cake for someone's birthday and heaven forbid a children's birthday cake which must be in the in the uh the the the, the shape of the castle in in frozen or something and the child will be in tears if it doesn't look exactly like it does on the uh film uh, and you get a recipe for your frozen castle and and all this icing and the decoration you can follow the instructions absolutely perfectly but it will not look like the picture because you're not a master baker you haven't been making cakes all day every day for the last 40 years and it's like that with the program you can put your back into it you can do it perfectly in terms of your uh spirit and your a attempt to pay attention to detail and to give it the time to give it the diligence but the results will be a mess but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter the princess cake tastes just as good if it looks like a catastrophe in one of those before and after things or like those compare and contrast things on buzzfeed you know the cake that they tried to make the cake as it actually came out both cakes will taste just fine but the second one will look terrible my recovery is a mess in lots of ways but it tastes great it tastes great um so uh, one starts to do 10, 11, and 12 right from the beginning. Um, uh, someone says to me, hurry up and make your first 10,000 mistakes. But then you might start getting good at it. Uh, I've lived ab abroad uh, on many occasions. I've lived in various different countries in France and Finland and Russia and Germany. And I tell you, learning to speak a foreign language by being thoroughly immersed, you have to make a fool of yourself constantly for months before you can have even, even a basic conversation and it's two years before you can make anyone laugh in a foreign language um and it's like that with with aa it takes a very long time of getting egg on your face sharing badly for a good 10 to 15 years before you say anything <laughs> which resembles what you intended to say but you have to get it wrong again and again and again. You have to plan the day badly to discover how to plan the day. Most alcoholics want to start doing step and steps 10 and 11 perfectly and get very frustrated that it looks like a mess. It doesn't matter. This is uh, you just have to do it program uh, regardless of, of, of uh, how well you think you're doing. Just do it. Um, so 10, 11, and 12, I think they're a package deal. And the package deal is this. Step 12 is the content of my life. 
Step 11, and I'll flesh that out. That's not it on step 12, by the way. This is going to be more, more than that one liner. Step 12 is the content of your life. Step 11 provides the structure for your life. And step 10 is the regulatory mechanism which keeps the whole thing functioning properly. So um, step 12, I'm going to start with step 12 as it's the content. Uh, my day, uh, there's a line on page 77 of the big book, which I think is underrated. Uh, I, I don't know what's in me. I must have been something I had for lunch. I've got the devil in me this afternoon. Um, I, hear, I heard someone say it was taco salad, so blame the taco salad. Uh, <laughs> it can't possibly be my personality that's the problem here. Um, I heard someone say it was at an, I won't even say which fellowship, because it might give it away which meeting it was if I say, but so we're talking about step nine. Someone says, yeah, the step nine, it's not for them. It's for me so that I feel better. Um, what it says, what it says in the big book, which is where they hid the program. I'm going to tell you in Al-Anon, they say we, 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 we work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Then what do they do? They delist the big book as a piece of conference approved literature. And if you mention it, they'll delist your meeting. They'll literally delist your meeting if you start talking about the big book. Anyway, back to the topic. Step nine. Um, we what it says in the book is we fit ourselves to be a maximum service to others. And to do that, I've got to have good relations with others. The, the step nine is about rebuilding the relationships. It's not about it's not about me feeling better. The feeling is the side effect of doing the right thing, of reestablishing relations so that people trust me. I'll give you an example of this. Um, uh, I, I've got the I've got a big mouth, mm -hmm. and I was in a group conscience situation about 16, 17 years ago, where I disagreed profoundly with what the group did. What happened? Treasurer runs away with the kitty with like 900 pounds. He hasn't been paying the rent for nine months. And so the venue is incandescent with rage. Um, the uh, group is in hock to the venue for 900 pounds and they need to also pay the rent going forward. And anyway, the poor chap has gone and, and, and relapsed. Um, and they the group decides, let's go to the police. Let's go. Let's go and report this bloke to the police. Then we'll get the money back. That was the thinking. They literally thought they were going to get the money back. I know. Uh, <laughs> he's drunk it. He's now living in a hostel in Mile End. You are not getting nine hundred pounds back from him. And if there was any hope of getting nine hundred pounds back from him, it's by being a group which is welcoming and tolerant and loving. So he feels he can come back and pay the money back voluntarily. But instead, if he gets a, a knock on the door from the Rosers saying you have to pay this money, he's never going to come back. It's a, yeah, that's a, if you want to kiss goodbye to the money, that's what you do. Anyway, the group decided everyone was very angry. AA, everyone was very angry. So they went to the police and I decided I disagreed with this. So I'm going to invent my minority opinion, you know, concept five, blah, blah, blah. They wouldn't have known a concept if it stood up in their suit, that group. But I'm God bless them. But it was the wrong thing to do. I, I, was, I, I was not after unity. I was after being right. And the die had already been cast. They'd already gone to the police. Nothing, you know, there's nothing, no good could come of this. Anyway, I called for a group conscience and I tried to orchestrate a particular person to take the group conscience. And then I thought if I get behind that person and uh, manipulate how they take the group conscience, we will get the result that we want. And the whole thing blew up in my face. Um, uh, it was like a firework box where the whole just woof, the whole thing went woof. And everyone was now not furious with the alcoholic who had the relapse, but me. I was now the bogeyman. And then the worst thing, the worst thing, uh, for a legitimate reason, I couldn't be at the group conscience where they were discussing this. So the poor buggers were there for an hour discussing this thing where the person who instigated it, me, yours truly, wasn't even there to, to suffer along with them. So I was absolute, absolutely persona non grata. You think you're carrying a message in AA, then you behave like that. 
you know, that it, 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 the harm I did from that, uh, the, the broken relationships with the group and, and with, anyway, I, I got to a round of amends. It was a couple of years later, so <laughs> better, better late than never, eh? It was a couple of years later, and uh, there's a whole list of people from that group I approached. One of them, uh, I think I timed him. That was probably an Alan on slip. I timed him. He shouted at me for 20 minutes without taking a breath. I think he'd perfected that circular breathing that didgeridoo players and Miles Davis would 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 use. Uh, and he just shouted, shouted, shouted. Uh, but then we were done. When I saw him at a meeting a couple of months later, he was fine. He was fine. And it was great. So he needed to do that. And I've learned to just listen and say yes, and just repeat, just, you know, let it play out, let the storm blow out. But there was a, a woman in that meeting, she was, I don't know what she was, she was, she was, she was, she was, she was the something, but she was very much uh, one of the old timers of that group. And she never liked me, for probably good reason, frankly. She'd never, she'd never liked me. Anyway, I, I tried I, I tried so many ways. I messaged her on Facebook. Or I added her on Facebook. I tried to pass messages through other people. I wrote her a letter. I went to groups where she went to. Um, she wouldn't reply, completely ignored me. And uh, I, I was asked to do a chair in Gospel Oak and I turn up and she's there. And I haven't managed to deliver the amend. I, I've sent it in various ways. I think it's been read, but I, I haven't managed to pin her down, grab her by the lapels and say, I've been a complete first class jerk. I really want to make amends to you. You were handling this perfectly. I messed it up. This was a nightmare of my own making. What can I do to make it right? And she was there. I thought, oh, God, I can't. And I was, I was supposed to do a chair on I don't know, honesty or something like that one of those terrible topics that just makes everyone silent um and so the before the meeting starts she had a newcomer in tow that was weeping or bleeding or a combination of the two and i so i i, I launched myself like an exocet missile across the room and i grabbed her and i said uh, so and so i i really need to apologize and she was gruff but as gracious as could be expected in the circumstances. And it was, it was fine. And I did that. I did done my duty, ticked the box on the list. I've done it. And uh, I did the chair, 10 minute chair, just a sort of bog standard, blah, 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 boom, done. And anyway, the newcomer comes up to me uh, after the meeting and says, would you sponsor me? I've been trying to get sober for 20 years and something you said really mirrored my experience. And would you, and I helped the person and uh, uh, through their own very good work on the program, they got sober and I happened to be the, the guide for this particular bit of her journey. But she told me a while later, and she's permanently sober now. She'd been trying for 20 years. So that, that was a, there was a turning point in her life at that time. I talked to her afterwards and she said after the meeting, she nudged this woman I'd made amends to and said, I want to ask him to sponsor me. Is he OK? And the woman said, he's OK. She would not have said that if that amend had not been made. And I don't think that relationship with that newcomer would have been forged. Now, she would have been if she was willing, she would have found someone else. But so it's things don't hang on this that god's dice are always loaded someone gave me two dice yesterday with the word god on each side so however you roll the two dice it always comes up god so someone that's willing will always find a way but something was facilitated there that would not have been possible without the amend so i think the amends are in order to fit oneself to be of maximum service to others by removing the blocks in my relationship with other people i had the most terror my brother was an alcoholic who committed suicide uh, on my mother's birthday, uh, 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 having sent her a letter saying, I can never see you again. You, it's just too intolerable. Being with you is too intolerable. And I had a relationship with my mother that was fractured and fractious and impossible to navigate. And to the point I, we couldn't spend time with each other. 
I found a way of making amends and I'm the one who now looks after her. And we get on like a house on fire. She's in her 90s. She has some form of cognitive degeneration. It's quite severe. She's almost blind. She's uh, almost deaf. She can barely walk, but we wheel her around and feed her chips and she's happy as anything. <laughs> so the amends are not about me. I am that which God's will is done through. Other people are that which God's will is done through. I'm not the hero of this, of anything. I, I, I'm just, uh, yes, the, 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 the notion of the hollow straw. And what step nine does is it removes the blockages which enable real work to be done. That's my experience of it. So step 12, having had a spiritual awakening, um, someone said to me, once, <laughs> so spiritual awakening, more like a rude awakening. Uh, you know, people's image of a spiritual awakening is like you're sitting like this on a little cushion and there are joss sticks and the colors are pale pastels and little you know, pale blues and pinks and there's a sunset, there is a sunrise, you're in skin tight leotards, your spine is perfectly aligned. I don't think mine is. I went to a an aura reader <laughs> in such that the Arizonans get that because they've they've been to Sedona. And this was in Sedona. I went to an aura reader who told me that my sacral chakra was shriveled. <laughs> uh, which is, it explains a lot of my sex inventory, I think. But uh, <laughs> leaving, leaving that entirely aside, a spiritual awakening is not about becoming nice and pleasant. It's not, it's, it's, it's about becoming aware of the horror of what you've been and what you've done in the world and going, oh my God, what, it, what must it be like to have been with me? One of my step nines, uh, I made amends to someone, a very old friend. Uh, when I was a kid, we ha I had this plastic toy where it was, it was like a radio and it had a cord that you would pull and you pulled the cord to its full extent. And as it retracted, it would play a little recording of like a, a radio jingle or something. And there were a dozen little things it could play. And when you pulled the cord and it retracted, you never knew which jingle you were gonna get, which little snippet of, it might be a snippet of news. It was a silly little thing. And I was like that, except when I was with friends, if anyone mentioned any one of about 12 topics, I would go off on a five to 10 minute diatribe about how those people were wrong or stupid or both. And one of my, I, I made a, a, what I thought was going to be a very, very low key amends. So I'm so sorry for, you know, and they said, yeah, that's why we stopped inviting you to things because we didn't know what was going to set you off. Oh, Christ. Uh, the awakening is not necessarily comfortable or it's not comfortable at first. The, 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 there is comfort as part of the deal, but it can come a lot later in the process. There are, fun, there are strange forms of satisfaction in the world um, which have nothing to do with pleasure and nothing to do with achievement and nothing to do with attainment, but that, that they come as part of the slow burn. Um, I saw a meme on Facebook. I wish I had it here to screen share it, but it was like, it was a, one of those two frame pictures. The top frame um, um, was a woman in a, in, a, in a kind of lotus pose or something. And it said, what we think a spiritual awakening would look like. And the bottom one was a, um, um, a woman just in the dark, like it almost looked like the alien set who was screaming and her face was contorted. And it said, I think I'm losing my mind. And it said below that, what a spiritual awakening is really like. You wake up to a lot of what is around you in the world. And you're like, this is completely mad. This does not make sense. Ain't comfortable takes a while to get used to it 
in the matrix, yet think the world outside the matrix would be nice, and it's not. It's not nice, it's something else. It's real and it's free, but it's not nice. Uh, in the C.S. Lewis Narnia books, of which there are seven, I think they're recommended reading. I know they're not on the GSO list of conference-approved literature mm -hmm. yet, but I think they ought to be. But there's a notion on there that, that uh, Aslan, who is the figure of uh, essentially God, but Jesus, really, um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying this from a sort of uh, a, a Christian point of view, but just by way of example, they say As and Aslan is a lion, and they say, is he tame? And they say, he's not tame. He's good, but he's not tame. God is not tame. You reach out to God and you say, I would like my life to be, I would like this pain to go. And a friend of mine says, when you ask sincerely for change to happen, duck. Because God will come at your life with a wrecking ball. You'll be fine. Your life won't necessarily be. All the things that you think are holding you together are killing you. And a spiritual awakening is realizing, for instance, that most of the people in your life, that the expiry date has been passed. And that's why you feel so sick. That can be one of the things. You have to be very careful with spiritual awakenings. There is a huge amount of power. Unless you know what you're going to do with it, you can do an awful lot of damage. It's very common for people to do the worst damage in their recoveries in the one year following their, the completion of their first set of amends. Very, very dangerous time. One should, at that point, uh, get closer to one sponsor. And I have, um, I, I don't know if you know, in The Lord of the Rings, they have, uh, also not conference approved, in The Lord of the Rings, they have these, these, these ghoulish characters called the Ring Wraiths, who are these former human kings, which are now these sort of ghostly uh, minions of Sauron, the great evil dark lord. Anyway, I have a number of people that I call when I'm in trouble. And because I ring them when I'm in trouble, I refer to them as the ring, my ring wraiths. And I, and I don't make a major decision without running it past some of these people. When I have a major breakdown in a relationship, and it needs to be autopsy, the, the, not the person needs to be autopsied, although maybe that too. Um, when the situation needs to be autopsied, I run it past several people who are on the same page in terms of relationship with God, relationship with the program, who have, have you know, 20 to 30 years of recovery, maybe more. Uh, people with good sense, sound minds, who are willing to tell me I'm full of, you know, uh, uh, four-letter word. Uh, very often, when people complete the first nine steps, they just go off. And it's it's it, it's not advised. That's when you need to get closer to the people. Just because you've been free does not mean you're safe. Um, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, um, my life has two elements. Once I, I've looked after myself, I, I get the basics in place. I don't enter the world of obligations until my head is in the right space. I'm in the right frame of mind. I've looked after myself uh, physically. I've had some breakfast. That may be, you may need to, to, to remind some, some of your newcomer friends that uh, <laughs> they, should, <laughs> they should have breakfast. It's, it's amazing how many times a sponsee calls you in a complete emotional crisis and you're uh, okay, you're like, let's go down the list. When did you last eat? Last Thursday. Have you slept? I slept for four hours yesterday afternoon and I stayed up till five o'clock in the morning playing computer games. And, and you're like, well, if you took a healthy person and you messed with their diet and you messed with their sleep, you would produce a crazy person in 24 hours. And so, and people, so much of AA, people are trying to solve problems emotionally and psychologically, which could be solved with a nap and a sandwich and maybe a meeting or two. <laughs> um, get those things sorted, get the basics first things first, get the 
the basics sorted out first. Once you've got the hang of breakfast, then start considering the true nature of the Trinity. That's the order you do this in, okay? Breakfast first, Trinity later. Um, so I get myself in a reasonably fit state, and then I have a day, part of the day when I fulfill obligations. And the way I handle this, people talk about balance, and the danger of balance is balance implies the same thing. Like a pair of scales, you have to have the same weight on both sides. And that doesn't help. That doesn't help you decide how much to do of any particular thing. Maureen, many years ago, she's AA and al -Anon. She gave me the image of a mobile of the sort that you have above a children's crib. So you have hanging from the mobile these horizontal bars and from each of the horizontal bars hangs a sequence of little little rotating um figures and each of those there might be multiple figures and if you just touch it the thing turns and then the individual things turn as well and it's beautiful if it breaks and you pull off one of the items the whole thing starts to turn crazily it's the whole thing is so perfectly balanced it's got to be uh, it's got to be intact to work. And my life is like that, except the system is dynamic. And by that, I mean what works in January may not work in September. And um, uh, 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 someone who is probably very famous, very, very well known to lots of people in here for, from uh, one of the Western cities, that's nice and anonymous, one of the Western cities says, it, it's like um, having a, a, a pack of dogs. You have to listen to which one is barking the loudest to know which one to feed next, because you can't feed all of them all at once. And so I've got various obligations. I've got work obligations. I have two jobs. I have household obligations. I have marital obligations. Um, um, an obligation sounds terrible. It means things which are the right thing for me to do. That, these are joyous, wonderful things, but they are still things which must be done. Uh, there's my mother, I've got other relatives. Uh, there's all the stuff, all the sort of looking after oneself stuff. And relying on God with the achieving an equilibrium with these is about constantly checking in with God, saying, what needs my attention today? What needs my attention this week? What needs my attention this month, making a list of things to do and then crossing half of them off. And just leaving myself with the next few things to do, the next five things to do, the next one thing to do. And allowing oneself to be led by intuition with that. So I, there's an obligations part of the day. And then there is a, uh, uh, I let myself off the hook at a certain time every day. And after then, I'm not obliged to take any phone calls. I'm not obliged to do anything. I need to let uh, Tom W. talks about, I think this is very good, a story about anthropologists. I know there's some Australians here. Anthropologists who are in the outback, who were watching, observing from a respectful distance and with full permission, um, uh, a, a uh, a nomadic tribe as they were trekking across the outback. And periodically, without anyone seeming to signal, the entire tribe would stop. And they might be stopped for a few minutes, or they might be stopped for hours. And uh, as Tom tells it, the, one of the anthropologists plucked up the courage to ask them one day, what are you doing? with this stopping and the chief of the tribe uh, apparently uh, looked at him like he was looking at a small child asking an idiot question and said, we're waiting for our souls to catch up. Mm. Now, a little word of warning about that because there's, there's a trap here. When I stop, and that can be a daily stop. It can be a weekly stop. So Saturday, you don't want to ask me to do anything on Saturday. It won't get done. Even if I agree to it, I'm going to forget. 
even if you remind me half an hour before, it's not going to get done. I just, just in case anyone ever asks me, don't ask me to do anything on a Saturday. It's today Saturday. What's today? Okay, today's the exception. There we go. Um, <laughs> because someone picked me up from the hotel, I didn't have any choice. <laughs> um, but sometimes when I go on holiday, it's the same thing. I need to stop for a few days. And people might want to go off on, you know, visiting museums. No. I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to let my soul catch up. And I don't know if you've ever been in a car when you've, you've braked hard and everything on the back seat flies forward and hits you in the head. And when I stop, the amount of stuff which, hit, which I've thrown in the back seat and haven't dealt with will hit me in the head. And part of me knows this which is why I won't let myself stop, because I'm frightened of what's going to hit me. So next time you stop, brace yourself. And you. And one of the tricks I've learned is to let whatever wants to come up inside me come up and be felt, regardless of how uncomfortable it is, um, uh, because all it is, is a feeling. It's literally not going to kill me. Um, alcoholics, in my experience, I include myself in this, are very averse to feeling anything. Uh, there are exceptions. Sometimes people don't want to make amends to someone because they're frightened it will bring up feeling in the other person. It's only us to whom that's a problem. Healthy people recognize that a full range of human emotions is part of life and it's fine. So I've had to be, in order to remain sane, I need to not let the back seat of my car build up with a whole load of crap because the longer you leave it, the worse it will get. And you won't be able to find anything back there after a while. So I do a lot of really regular stopping and I even, and this is a trick, um, uh, it's a useful skill to learn to have a signal to say to friends or your other half or the people in your household that you're not available for verbal interaction for an hour or two and to have them to get that pre-approved so you can just have some space. And if they need to write you a note, you give them a a block of post-it notes and a pen. <laughs> uh, there are times I cannot take any more interaction. I just need to stop until I'm okay. And I don't know how long that's gonna how long that's gonna take. Um, there are we. What I'm gonna suggest is that we do. Uh, someone's asked about questions. Maybe five minutes to see if there are any questions. If you pop your little Simpsons hat, virtual Simpsons hand up, if you have a question, then we'll. We'll take a couple of questions if there are any. Or if not, uh, save them for after the break and uh, we'll come to them in the second I was part of ask this. Relative Sorry, Josh? Anything on step 11? Practical suggestions? I know we were, it was 10 and 11. I just wanted to throw that one in there. Well, you see, I didn't cover to you. See, I've gone off. I've gone off script. I've gone rogue, Josh. Was, I've got. It's. I've already gone too far. I can't turn back now. Yeah. So no, no I was aiming questions, to Robert. cover. I was <laughs> aiming to cover some some ten eleven in the next session, which is going to be four thirty Mountain Time. But someone had a little hand, and then the little hand. This was it, Lynn, in the Bay Area. Bay Area, everyone. <laughs> Lynn, have you got your quip? Hmm? I did. Dodgers, there we go. Lynn, do you have a, your question? Oh, uh, Josh, I think you need to allow people to unmute. There you go. Okay, sorry. Oops, now I took... Okay, anyway, <laughs> sorry about the video. I just wanted... I actually had lowered my hand because it, it reverted back. You started talking about Al-Anon, and, and I just wanted to see... I, it's not 10th step. That's why I put my hand back down. Do you mind saying kind of in a nutshell, like besides how a lot of Al-Anons don't understand how 
they have alcoholism. And I was just wondering maybe a first step for Al-Anon. Um, if that's okay, I ask. If not, wait, you can pass. Yes, well, well, briefly, I wouldn't say they have al alcoholism. Me and my friends- For the disease, Al -Anon... family, right, yeah, family okay. disease, sorry. Uh, understood, understood. Um, so what we say is we have al -Anonism. Uh, and one useful way of looking at that is to say I have an allergic reaction to alcoholics. I get all entangled and up in their business when I should leave well alone in a thousand different ways. And I think that's the essence of it. I, um, I have the mental obsession. Uh, I keep going back when I shouldn't. And when I'm in there, I'm stuck in there for the duration. In a nutshell, for me, that's what it boils down to. Uh, Ailish, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you. I'm Ailish. Thanks very much, Tim. I've just um, come in. Uh, thanks to Patrick for putting up the reminder. Um, yeah, I have two questions. The first one, 10, 11, and 12, um, you gave a lovely description of the three of them, just a brief description, but um, at the start, and I got to 12 was the content of my life, and I've forgotten, I'm quite tired here, it's late. I forgot what you said 10 and 11 was. Yeah, so briefly on that, 11, uh... Uh, 11, step 11, to me, provides the structure for my day. And step 10, step 10 is the regulatory mechanism. So in the next yeah. session, I'll be covering those in more detail. You said you had another question. Yeah, I have a, a, another question. That it's the first time I've heard it. Um, I know this, but that alcoholics don't like feelings. We don't deal with them well um, in comparison to the general population we say normal people and um, that's very true i agree with you how do you know that though uh, i'd say so the question is um i asserted <laughs> that alcoholics don't like feelings uh how do i know this so i know it from my own experience and i know it from sponsoring a lot of people who do a lot of work to avoid feeling things and we'll run and run and run and run and run. Patrick. Oh, hey, Tim. It's great to see you and hear you. And thank you. Um, you know, the, the sponsorship part of step 12, you know, when some meetings I hear announcements like if you've had a spiritual awakening as a result of all 12 steps, you may raise your hand if you wish to sponsor somebody. And uh, I don't know, my early sponsor said, as soon as we do step five, you go out and you find sponsees. <laughs> so, uh, which is what I did. And I think my first sponsee forced me to do the rest of the steps because I had to stay a step ahead of him. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, what's your thought on all that? Okay, so the question is about wh when is a person able to sponsor? Um, I think it... You've got two factors here. You've got the person's ability to sponsor, and then you've got the question of what the need is locally. If people are dying of alcoholism locally and you don't have enough people who are two, five, 10, 20 years sober to sponsor them, the newer people just have to do it. Because what are you going to do? Let them die? As long as you can stay ahead of the person. Um, because the thing is, sponsors are not therapists. Um, they're, not, they're, they're not anything except... Uh, that, that they there's a very that sponsorship is encapsulated in the big book in a single line which is uh having had the experience yourself you can give much practical advice there you go that's it so you, you you're showing what was shown to you that's all so i i'm not for over regulating this thing uh there are that the, they used to say in the city lunchtime meetings in in london that there is a uh, what do they say? There's there, there's a wrench for every there's a wrench for every nut. Um, there's old Frank. I, I I love people's nicknames when it's old so and so, <laughs> and you wonder have they always been old Frank? Um, but old Frank 
uh, he would complain that uh, people would say, oh, the men should sponsor the men, the women should sponsor the women. He said, how about alcoholics sponsoring alcoholics? What about that? Now, I understand the need to, you know, um, uh, keep people separated in certain senses, but but um, one of the things I love about AA is it allows people to be themselves, and it, we just let anyone in. I mean, just look around the room. We let anyone in, and I'm looking at myself here. You let me in. Um, and who knows what's going to work? Sometimes you see the most extraordinary is a cafe in London which for, for a long time was whenever you look around, there'd be five little pairs of people with big books and notepads. And you looked at the pairings and it was like, is this, this is the, I, I can't believe these two people are working together. They seem so ill-suited, but it works. So I, I wouldn't want to outline what would work for someone else and what, what doesn't. Um, a, a, a story that I think my sponsor um, tells about someone who was, who had uh, in a particular part of, of Texas uh, uh, what was thought of as a rather uh, unruly uh, sponsor, a, a Hell's Angel uh, biker. Uh, and it was in a part of Texas where lots of people were very prim and orderly. And someone said to her, you little missy, you got the wrong sponsor. And she said, yeah, maybe, but I've got the right higher power. And I think the higher power is capable of working through really broken people like like me and awkward difficult people like me it, uh, things work even though they shouldn't um so so jason have you got a question there yeah um thanks tim um yeah great talk um on the Alan on stuff um uh the question is um <clears throat> do you have like a daily checklist because um i think i, I find it uh, really easy to get off track with my Alan on disease A daily checklist for what? Um, to check um, if you're acting out in your Al-Anon behaviour. Because from your talk this morning, I can see that in the last 24 hours, I've been acting out in my Al-Anon behaviour, but I couldn't see it. Maybe there's like a step 10 tool to keep a check of it. Oh, it's, a, it's a very good question. So the question for the people in the room is, how do you know you're acting out in an Al-Anon? Uh, sense. Uh, so I'll give you I'll give you a few ways in which I know I'm acting out. First of all, I'm tired. That'll tell you. Uh, secondly, as I said earlier, when you're thinking about people who are not in the room, um, if I get to the end of the day and I found might find myself replaying episodes conversations or pre-playing how I'm going to handle them next time because obviously God is not powerful enough to tell me what to do the next time the situation arises so I'm going to pre-play it and work through all the permutations and make sure every answer is nailed and then say hmm, no, no, I've, you know, I've got this absolutely down now uh, that's how I know I'm in trouble and that's when I need to stand you know, step away from the vehicle uh, and last question, then we'll have a break. Harry. Mm, can you hear me all right? Uh, we can hear you, yeah. I put my camera on so you can see me. Um, my spon on off sponsor actually gave me a link for this today, so I really appreciate it, Tim, because I've listened to most of what you've had to say all day. So I've been trying to get sober for six years now, and um, I've got a few days ago now. Um, last year, 2022, you know, I went to three rehabs, multiple hospital visits, multiple arrests. Just blackout most of the year. My drinking's very quick to blackout. I don't know how many days it's going to last. I don't know what's going to happen. Frequently violent, you know, smashing the house up, coming to, not knowing what I've done. That's the sort of behaviour that um, happens when I take a drink and I know that and I know I'm on my last chance saloon now you know the fucking states I've been getting in the amount the quantities I'm taking I'm either going to kill myself if I carry on or go to prison for a long time but I've been trying for six years and you know like last year I was very suicidal at points but I just don't see how 
everyone else seems to get it. And I've tried, you know, like you said, since it's 20 years sober. They've tried, they've tried for 20 years. You know, I'm 27 now. I know I won't make 30 if I carry on, but I just haven't been able to stop. I'm just in a minute, uh, in the process, a minute trying to sort things with my girlfriend who said she doesn't want to be here anymore and wants me to leave tomorrow. So, you know, I've lost my license this year, my job, and now my home. Um, Sorry, yeah, it's just a bit fucking. It's just shit. And I can I'm... hear. I can hear a question. I can hear a question in there. And I just for the room, I think that the the question, if there is one, is uh, you've been trying so hard for a number of years to get sober. What can you do to make sure you stay sober permanently this time? What can you do differently? Uh, all I can do, I can't give advice to any individual. I can tell you what I did uh, on in. 24th July 1993, I made the decision, I don't care what happens to my life. If all AA delivers to me is sobriety, that's good enough. If I'm just one of these strange shuffling people that sits at the back of meetings all day, every day, I don't care. As long as I'm sober and I have the dignity of being sober, that is enough. And I found a sponsor. I said, I'll do whatever you say. And I did it. Uh, and I've never seen that fail. Uh, Josh, uh, should we stop the recording and then let's start again at... Uh... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.